We're jumping into the book of Mark today with a question that Jesus asks twice. Same question asked twice and twice answered differently by different people with different agendas. So turn with me to Mark chapter 10. We're going to go from verses 32 to 52. Mark 10, 32 to 52. They were on their way up to Jerusalem when Jesus, leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn, uh, condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside, begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. This passage starts off with Jesus telling his disciples that he's going to Jerusalem to be betrayed and mocked and spit on and killed. And three days later to rise, that is, the resurrection. Now nobody says anything at this point. And I think they might be afraid, given what happened to Peter when Peter confronted Jesus about you know, talking. Uh, when Peter confronted Jesus about talking about all this dying nonsense and we saw that last week now maybe they get it or maybe they still don't understand what what uh, Jesus dying is about but they hear that three days later he will rise and even though they don't understand the death Jesus is talking about they do understand resurrection and they understood that everyone will be resurrected at once and there will be some kind of uh, separation after that the righteous to glory and the wicked to judgment and once that's done, the Messiah will set everything right and reestablish God's glorious kingdom through Israel. 
That means when Jesus is resurrected, he will be the guy sitting at the top and in charge. And you know, this is where I can hear echoes of my own father saying, um, and I'm sure many uh, of my Chinese friends growing up, they would hear their parents saying, hey, you know, that guy's a big deal. Go get to know him. He'll be good for your future. Because if Jesus is going to be in charge, there's an opportunity to be at the top with him. So James and John ask, no, they say to Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask. That's a weird way to bring up a request to a teacher. Now, some people might think of it rude, but you have to remember that these are, you know, uneducated and rough around the edges kind of people. And, and they're, they're young, you know, most of them being teenagers. And the request in itself is a bit ironic. You know, you don't usually tell your teacher what to do. Your teacher is the one who tells you what to do. But Jesus doesn't brush them off. He listens to, to their request and he asks them, what do you want me to do for you? Oh, he's not saying no. He's not rebuking the request. And it's quite a loaded question with so much potential for James and John. What do you want me to do for you? Now, how would you respond to this if Jesus asked you this question? And for James and John, they wanted the two top jobs when you establish, uh, when, when, when Christ would establish his kingdom. Now remember, these are laborers by trade. And in the Roman Empire, you know, it's the people with money and power who had the most influence in society. That's how, that's just how things were. Wealth and power legitimated, uh, legitimated what you could do. It meant that, you know, it meant you were doing something right. You had the favor of the, the so-called gods. James and John wanted more than what they had. They wanted something that they could only dream of. Legitimacy, power, wealth, influence. Because then they would be somebody. Then they could be seen as successful. Then they could be considered great. And we may not uh, necessarily ask for positions of power, but we might ask to be made a bit more comfortable in life. We might ask for better opportunities and maybe greater influence. We might ask for God's favor in our work or blessing in our businesses um, to be a bit more successful. But don't, under, don't misunderstand me. Asking God for these things isn't necessarily wrong. But you do need to look at your motive behind it. The request by James and John isn't necessarily wrong, assuming they understood Jesus correctly. But they don't. That's what was wrong. Their quest for greatness and glory reveals, uh, reveals a huge misunderstanding on their part about who Jesus is. And Jesus, I mean, he, he kind of calls them out on it. He says to them, you don't know what you're asking. And it's true, they don't. They think they do, but they don't. And he says, can you drink? from the same cup and be baptized with, this, with the baptism I am baptized with. Now, he's talking about two things here, cup and baptism. What, what is this cup, first of all? Well, if you remember, in, uh, before Jesus is arrested, he's, uh, he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says this to God. He says, take this cup from me, not, uh, yet not what I will, but what you will. This is the cup of judgment that the enemies of God would drink from. You know, it, it represents God's wrath and anger towards his enemies. Now, with Jesus drinking it, in effect, Jesus is absorbing in himself that judgment, that wrath that God directs towards his enemies. And so Jesus is saying, are you willing to drink from this cup rather than make others drink it? Are you willing to absorb your own wrath instead of lashing it out on your enemies? Are you willing to hang on to that need for revenge toward those who, who, uh, who, who you think deserve it rather than act out on it? Are you willing to let go of your rights for the sake of someone else's life? And then what about baptism? 
Well, Jesus talks about being baptized with a baptism he is baptized with. It sounds a bit convoluted. No? Jesus here, at least, he isn't referring necessarily to going into water and coming up. Uh, Luke 12 talks about a baptism that Jesus needs to undergo still, referring to his journey to the cross. It's a baptism of suffering. And so Jesus is asking James and John, are you willing to undergo the suffering that this world gives? Are you willing to be hurt by those who offend you? Are you willing to be sinned against? And you know, without knowing what Jesus means, uh, in their misunderstanding of glory and greatness, the answer like, like little children who can only see that they're getting what they want. And they're like, oh yes we can, we surely can. Well, Jesus knows the road ahead for his disciples and he gives them a warning. The irony of all this is that you know, James and John, they will be the ones drinking the same cup and undergoing the same baptism. Only it doesn't mean what they think it means. So Jesus challenges their idea of greatness. He redefines this in light of servanthood. It's not by being overpowering or exercising, exercising tyranny. Greatness is about serving. Now after this we get a, um, another story which acts as a bit of a contrast. Now we have this blind beggar sitting by the roadside. Uh, that's where he would be most visible to others passing by. And he's, he's there in the hopes that people would give him, give him money. His name is Bartimaeus, or Blind Bart. Uh, his name actually means son of uncleanness. A son of unclean. What kind of parent would name their kid this, you know? Come here, unclean son. Uh, or maybe it's his parents who are the unclean ones, right? He's the son of the unclean ones. Anyways, so someone tells him that Jesus is about to pass by. And, you know, he's, he's heard this name before. And he knows there's something about this name, this person. So he takes the opportunity to yell out to him. Now what stands out about Bart is that he calls on Jesus by name and adding in uh, the title of Son of David without ever having met him. In fact, he not only calls out, but he creates quite a ruckus. And those around him who hear him kind of shouting, uh, making all this noise, uh, these onlookers, they, they, they tell him to shut up. But he screams out even more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. James and John wanted glory. But this guy, blind and sat on the roadside, he wants mercy. Son of David, have mercy. You hear the difference? James and John, teacher, we want you to do anything we ask of you. They think it's about power, greatness, entitlement. Bart, he sees what they don't. He's blind, but he sees more. He understands what we all need. Mercy. He knows he has nothing to offer God. He knows he deserves nothing. You know, and that, that, that's the one thing people who, who come to be served don't understand. Because if I'm here to be served, it's not mercy that's close to my heart. It's my expectations, my happiness, my satisfaction. And so Jesus hears this, he, and he goes up to Blind Bart and he asks him the same question. What do you want me to do for you? His answer is different. I want to see. Have mercy on me. I want to see. Now, there was a tradition of knowledge that the son of David uh, would, would heal. There are a couple passages uh, that the story of Blind Bart points to. The first one is in Isaiah 35. Um, it, 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 it's quite a long chapter. Uh, it, it's basically Isaiah uh, telling us that the way to restoration and healing in this world, okay, is through mercy. It's through God's mercy. 
And then in Isaiah 61, uh, Jesus' mission, you know, where he is anointed to preach a good news uh, to the poor, blind, uh, bind up the broken heart, proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners or the blind. Okay, there's this, there's this healing, this restoration, this that comes out of mercy, and and so, furthermore, by asking Jesus for mercy, he shows that he does already see who Jesus is. He knows something about the Son of David, and this calling of of, of Jesus as the Messiah, as the one who will give mercy and through his mercy would bring restoration, would bring healing to this world. And this is something that the disciples haven't yet quite grasped. Jesus is showing what exactly it means to serve rather than be served. And so here he takes time out for the marginalized, the outcasts, the nobodies in society. And he takes time out for blind Bart. What do you want me to do for you? Bart asks for mercy. I want to see. And Jesus says, what does he say? He says, it's yours. You ask for mercy. It's yours. And then he tells him, go. Go. In other healing stories, Jesus tells the person healed to go and see a priest or to go home. Here, he just tells Bart to go. Go where? Seeing who Jesus is, Bart doesn't go his own way. But he follows Jesus along the road. That is along the, ro uh, the way to Jerusalem. The way of mercy, the way of the cross, where Jesus is going. You know, it's easy as Christians to talk the Christian talk, to say the right things. But when you're living life and interacting with others, what do you choose? What's your motivation for living the way you live? Is it this idea of greatness that overpowers others? Or is it about showing mercy? Living out mercy. And so I ask some of you, parents, what are you, what are you modeling to your children? What do they see when they look at how you treat other parents? Or how you treat their teachers or their friends and how you treat them, your children? Or when you come across someone in need, what do your children see? Some of you might be working or will be working in you know, management positions. How, how would you treat your employees? How would you treat your customers and clients? What about your colleagues? How, how would you treat them? How would you treat the most junior member of your workplace? How, how do you treat the, the custodian, the janitors? Two contrasting stories. One requesting for power, the other for mercy. Which do you want from God? And with which do you want God to treat you? I think those who truly know Jesus know which to prefer. Let's pray. Father God, would you humble our hearts and help us to recognize that, Lord, we bring nothing to the table. That whatever life that you call us to live, whatever transformation that we experience in our lives, uh, by your spirit it's all because of your mercy 
whatever blessings um, we we have in life, it is because of your mercy. Lord, really, the only thing we we deserve is is eternal punishment. Lord, I pray that we would keep mercy in our minds and hearts. And just as we have received mercy from you, Lord, may we be the ones to show mercy to others. Give us strength to do that. Even when it's difficult, even when we want to react in the most forceful and perhaps violent and overpowering way. Help us show mercy. In Jesus' name we pray.